There's a very good chance that if you're watching this video, you're a self-taught pickleball player. And there's an even bigger chance that you're currently making some pretty bad mistakes that stand in the way of getting better fast. You see, the speed in which you improve will be determined mainly by how much you play. But throughout your progress, you'll constantly be running into problems with your technique and strategy. And because you're self-taught, you're probably searching for these answers in the wrong places. So there's a very good chance that you're probably making some, if not all the mistakes that I'm about to go through. So try to understand them so that your progress can become more linear. So the first mistake that self-taught pickleball players make is they don't understand how or when to use spin. So an important thing to keep in mind is that whenever a high level player is playing pickleball, on every shot, they're always gonna be either using top spin or slice. So there's very few occurrences where you're not trying to put one of those spins on the ball. And this applies anywhere on the court. So when I'm dinking, if I'm trying to be aggressive, I'm going for my top spin dinks, okay? So I'm rolling over the ball and trying to make the ball spin away from me. This makes the bounce jump more at your opponents and it makes the ball arc more over the net. This applies at the back of the court too. If I'm going for a drop and I want to be aggressive, I can go for my topspin drop. If I want to be more defensive, I can go for my slice drop. The topspin drop doesn't sit up as much, so if it goes in, it makes it a little easier for me to move forward. If I'm going to do a drive, I'm generally always hitting topspin. So I'm almost always trying to get topspin when I hit my drive. Essentially, you can think of topspin as your aggressive spin and slice as your more defensive passive spin. This isn't the case every single time, but generally, whenever you're trying to be aggressive, you're gonna be using topspin. So remember, in terms of getting that spin, all we need to do to get topspin is brush up like this and roll over the ball a little bit. Slice is the exact opposite. I'm gonna come under the ball. So we'll start off with some topspin dinks here to show you how that looks. So I'm getting those topspin dinks, just rolling up a little bit behind each shot. This makes it a little bit harder for Drew to react. So one more topspin. Now let's do some slice. So I'm gonna be going under the ball and I'm cutting at it. So I can still be kind of aggressive with my slice dink, but my tops and dink's gonna ultimately be a little bit more effective. The next mistake that self-taught pickleball players make is they don't move like an athlete. So watch these two examples of me dinking and try to determine which one looks better. All right, I tried to make that as obvious as I could, and option two is clearly better movement. I look more like an athlete, and I was using the proper footwork. So, what are the three golden rules of moving like an athlete in pickleball? Rule number one is that you want to always stay relatively low with a wide base whenever you're waiting for the ball. You don't want to be standing up high like a school bus, you want to be low like a Ferrari. Rule number two is generally you want to have most of your weight on the balls of your feet. So a lot of the time people say stay on your toes. You don't want to be resting on your heels. It's a lot harder to explode side to side when you're on your heels. Rule number three is that while you're moving, you wanna to try to stay on balance and try to keep your head still. So I don't wanna be like flailing around as I'm moving. I wanna to try to be stable and very fluid when I move so that I'm always ready for the next ball. It's not just about getting to one ball, it's about getting there and being on balance so that you can do a good job on the next shot too. So let's see a bad example of what it looks like when I'm trying to move forward. I'm not on the balls of my feet, I'm not low, which makes it really hard stay on balance for those more difficult shots. Now let's go through a good example where I'm following all three of the golden rules. So there, it was really easy for me to hit my shots into the kitchen because I was very stable. I wasn't falling over and it always felt like I was in the right position for every shot. So use those three golden rules and everything else in your game will become a lot easier. Later in this video though guys, I'm gonna go over how to control momentum in your games, so stay tuned. Mistake number three is that self-taught players are generally not very intelligent about where they're positioned on the court throughout the point. The number one way players can screw this up is by not knowing when they should move forward and when they should stay back, okay? So if you're the serving team and you're starting off back, the number one indication that you should move forward is that your opponent is going to have to hit up on the ball, okay? So if your opponent has to hit up on the ball, that's your ticket to come forward into the kitchen. Let's see an example of that. So here I'm gonna hit my drop, which forces Drew to have to hit up on the ball, and he has to dink it back, and now I'm up, and we're in a neutral situation. Another good time to move in is when you hit a really hard and low drive. Because think, if I hit a hard and low drive, he can't really hit down on the ball, and it's gonna be very difficult for him to keep that ball low. So that could also be a good time to move forward. 
So that could look something like this. The other side of the coin though, is that to be an effective player, you need to know when not to move forward. So if I'm giving Drew high balls on my drops like this, that's my indication that I should stay back so that I can try to get the next one at his feet, right? If I was to run in in that situation, I would get completely killed, right? So if you're giving your opponent a higher shot where they can hit down on it, you need to stay back, okay? And if your partner does that, you need to stay back. You don't wanna be moving forward for no reason. If I give Drew a mid-height ball, Generally, that gives me the indication that I could move into about the transition zone, right? And then I can have a slightly easier shot here and an easier opportunity to drop the ball in the kitchen. That looks something like this. So I give Drew a mid-height shot, come into the transition zone, which gives me that easier ball that I can reset into the kitchen. The other part of court positioning that self-taught players don't understand is shading. Shading refers to where I should be shifting side to side throughout the point, depending on where the ball is. So shading can be a little complicated, but to keep things simple, the basics of shading are that when you're at the front of the court at the kitchen, you follow where the ball is. So if the ball is on the left side of the court, me and my partner are gonna shift this way. If the ball's on the right side of my court, we're gonna shift towards the ball over here. When I'm at the back, we do the exact opposite, okay? Because we wanna cover the angle, okay? So if I'm back here and Drew has the ball on that side, I'm gonna shift here to cover the middle and my partner will shift over to cover that angle. And if it was on the other side, we do the exact opposite. So having good court positioning is one of the fastest ways to improve your game because you're just always going to be in a better position to hit whatever ball is coming at you. But if you want to improve in the long run, you need to have constant information coming in that you can apply to your game so you can get over those roadblocks that hamper your progress. And every video that we post, there might be one tip, one thing that you can apply to your game that will get you over those humps. So make sure to subscribe so that you're always notified and you see all our videos. The next mistake that self-taught pickball players make is that they may have developed extreme issues with their technique since they never really taught how to do things properly. So the top three extreme issues with technique that I see are one, using the wrong grip on the volleys, which looks like this. So I'm using the windshield wiper volley technique where I'm using the same side of my paddle to hit every volley, it looks like this. You wanna use the opposite side of the paddle and you wanna have the continental grip, which looks like this. See how I'm flipping it back and forth? The next big technical mistake I see is that players really have no confidence in using their backhand, specifically their backhand drive. There's a lot of different reasons for this. I have a video on how to hit a good backhand if you wanna check that out. But a lot of times players are just very not confident with their backhand and they try to hit their forehand at all costs. The third mistake is that they don't have a soft game. They've never developed the ability to dink into the kitchen, to drop into the kitchen, which makes it very hard for them to progress in the long run. And when self-taught players have these big deficits in their game, generally they don't try to cure them, they try to shield them by, let's say you don't have a soft game, being a banger. Or let's say you don't have a good backhand, trying to hit a forehand on every shot. Or maybe you don't have the best volleys, maybe you try to stay back and win from the back. So that's obviously not the answer. So what I'm gonna prescribe is that you create your own little side project outside of playing games to try to fix your problems so that you can have a whole complete game. So let's say you're using the wrong grip on your volleys and you want to try to develop the right grip, the continental grip. It's gonna be difficult to get enough practice on the court if you don't have a good drilling partner. So what you can do is just find a wall, get on the Dink Master and start off slow. You know, working on that right grip, trying to use that right technique so that when you come to the courts, slowly but surely, you actually have that right volley technique and down the line, in six months, a year from now, your volleys are gonna be way better. You can do the same exact thing on your backhand. You can start off by slowly just using the right technique, bumping the ball against a wall, just getting the hang of it, right? So that when you come to the courts and people are blasting the ball all over the place, it feels a little easier to get started. And obviously when it comes to the soft game, it's a great thing you can do is just practice dinking you know, against the wall, trying to keep the ball in a certain area on every shot. Here I'm just trying to keep my ball below the green line on the Dink Master. I've seen so many players that do these kinds of drills that can't dink, that can't drop, but they just do simple wall drills trying to keep the ball, you know, for targets below a green line. And next thing you know, they're an advanced player, they can drop, they can dink, they're probably at a four or a four or five level. Yeah. The last mistake that self-taught pickleball players make is they don't understand how to control the momentum in a game. All right, now I want you to think about your last game, all right? There's a very low chance that the way the scoring went was one team scored one, the other team scored one, one team scored two, the other team scored one, right? 
Generally, pickleball games go in streaks. So maybe one team starts off hot and they win six points, then the momentum shifts and the other team ties it at six all because they score six points in a row too. I'm sure you've probably played games where this has happened. So the key to winning in the long term is learning how to react mentally when these sorts of shifts are happening. And most players that were never coached don't know how to do this. I think the hardest thing for people to understand is that a lot of the time when you're playing, your opponents are going to go on a streak and they're going to get hot. The key to stopping this though, is to just stay consistent with your smartest possible strategy. Know that they're going to come back down to earth and they're going to stop playing at that level. So what you don't wanna do is just start giving up, going for dumb shots because you're like, oh, these guys are way too good, this isn't even fair. Stay with your smartest strategy and I guarantee you after three to four points, they're gonna start missing again and you're gonna get the ball back for your serve. When you're on a streak, this is a little bit simpler mentally in terms of how you should process this but the moral of the story is that you don't wanna lose focus and you don't wanna take your foot off the gas. I see so many players that win four points in a row and they're like, oh, I'm gonna win the game, this is over. I got this in the bag. And the next thing you know, it's 4-10 and they're about to lose, right? So if you have a streak, make sure you keep your foot on the gas and you don't let up. And guys, if you're a self-taught player, you need to make sure that you know the right strategies so that you can beat high-level players. This next video goes through all my favorite strategies that I've used to win at a pro level.